Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 253. I'm the host, Kyle Anselone. Today, joined by co-host Connor Freeman. Connor, how are you doing? Doing great, Kyle. How are you? Doing very well. Happy to have you back on, Connor. Just want to, you know, first of all, say happy Thanksgiving, at least to the American audience here, and remind everyone that uh, no Friday show this week, so the next time you'll see a Conflicts of Interest in your podcast feed, it'll probably be Sunday, Sunday afternoon, uh, I'll put out a new show. And, uh, you know, with this being a holiday week, this might be on the shorter end. I know a lot of people are busy, so, uh, you know, maybe if it's a little more bite size, it'll be easier to watch. Uh, just be sure to share the show if you're listening. It's at the Libertarian Institute, antiwar.com, YouTube, Rumble, and Odyssey. And then you can find the show uh, on our Twitter ch- uh, channel, at con underscore interest so uh you know find any way to find the show and then uh, just share it out there and you know get introduced to new people hell if you're having thanksgiving dinner people are like where do you get your news from maybe talk up the show a little bit help us out get a couple more listeners that way uh connor and then people could support the show by doing their cbd shopping with paloma verde paloma verde cbd.com the promo code is peace when people spend 75 dollars or more and use that promo code the show gets a kickback on every purchase uh so it's an absolutely fantastic way for the show to you know quickly ra- uh you know rack up the money uh that me and connor need not only to continue to do this but also to improve the show pay for the hosting fees and everything like that uh so connor what have you been uh getting from paloma verde My latest purchase was uh, I got uh, a bunch of the uh, doggy treats. And so now what I'm doing is first thing in the morning, I'm giving my dog, who's about 60 to 70 pounds approximately, I'm giving her seven of these uh, chewies or these treats. And uh, man, I've noticed a huge difference. I don't think I was giving her the uh, sufficient dose originally. And uh, I've noticed just a tremendous improvement. Um, you know, she can walk much longer. Uh, she can walk much more regularly. I mean, way calmer. Uh, she's just, um, her, she's 11 years old, as I've said before, but her, I mean, she's like acting much like years younger all of a sudden, to be honest. It's pretty fantastic. And I don't, I mean, It's just really great to see. And uh, she has a very easygoing uh, sort of vibe about her, very relaxed uh, and uh, cheerful and happy. And so that's awesome. I also still love the tinctures. I'm using them all the time. Uh, Like I said, I get the uh, the 2200 something uh, bottle. So each dropper is about 75 milligrams, which for me uh, pretty much will last me the whole day. Uh, I've got another one that's like one of the 450. So if I need, I'll just take another 15 milligrams. Uh, but I really like the just straight up CBD mint tincture. The taste of it is delicious. And it just seems to me to be just everything I need. If I got any kind of back issue from sitting in the chair all day, or, you know, if I just want to have a little bit more uh, intense of a workout and sort of mitigate any kind of fatigue that might come up or resistance, CBD is just absolutely the best. And I've never had anything as strong or as effective as the Paloma Verde uh, tincture. All right. Thank you so much, Karen. Paloma Verde, CBD.com. The promo code is PEACE. I have just one or two articles to mention here today, Connor, before I hand the show over to you to talk Iran news. Uh, The first is U.S. warship conducted Taiwan Strait Transit in early November. Uh, And this is interesting because almost always, Connor, uh, these are reported within 48 hours of them happening, maybe, you know, a week at the most. But this is a couple weeks old now. Uh, The U.S. and Navy apparently sent a warship through the Taiwan Strait on November 5th, but the public uh, but the transit was not made public at the time. The commander of U.S. Pacific Fleet told reporters on Friday. And, Connor, this timing of this seems somewhat, I don't know, maybe problematic to me. You know, Biden just met with the Chinese leader. And so we were hoping for a reduction of ties, uh, of tensions, excuse me. But uh, that, you know, the U.S. is now making this public, it seems that China may feel pressured to issue some kind of response. And so that could, you, you know, kind of re uh escalate the escalatory cycle between the the U.S. and China here uh, that had maybe started to wane as, you know, there were talks not only between Biden and the Chinese leader, but also the American and the Chinese uh, defense secretaries this week. We also have 
our Vice President Kamala Harris warning an attack on the Philippines uh, in the South China Sea would trigger a U.S. response. And Dave DeCamp writes, Vice President Kamala Harris on Monday reaffirmed that an attack on the Philippines vessel in the South China Sea would trigger a U.S. response under the 1951 Mutual Defense Treaty between the U.S. and the Philippines. The warning to Beijing came as she was visiting the Philippines. An armed attack on the Philippines armed forces, public vessels, or aircraft in the South China Sea would invoke a U.S. mutual defense commitment, and that is the unwavering commitment that we have made to the Philippines, Harris said while meeting with uh, the president, Marcos Jr. He's recently elected. Uh, Duarte was, was the former president there. Harris' warnings came amid reports of a tense encounter between Chinese and Philippines vessels in the South China Sea. The Philippines Navy said a Chinese vessel blocked a Philippines naval boat on Sunday and forcibly seized what appeared to be uh, Chinese rocket debris that a Philippines boat was towing. So uh, I guess China fired, test fired some missile. The Philippines found it and uh, <laughs> the Chinese wanted it back and took it. Uh, for their part, China denies it was forcibly seized and said the vessel took the debris after having a friendly negotiation at the scene. Um, my guess is that the, the Philippines' interpretation of this event is far more accurate than the Chinese one uh, that we're getting here. Uh, the incident happened near uh, the Spratly Islands. And so, you know, these are islands, if people are looking here, these are way out in the South China Sea. Um, now, the Philippines, of course, claims them. And, you know, Connor. This is the other side of the world from us, so I really don't think the U.S. has any business refereeing here, but yet we, we continue to our, assert ourselves. Uh, one last story to talk about, Connor. I just wanted to mention uh, the, this story on Korea by Dave DeCamp, but we've been covering it a lot on the show. Uh, you know, I've been writing on the North Korea situation a lot, and Dave has been keeping up with it this past week. U.S. flies more bombers with South Korea after North's intercontinental ballistic missile test. Tension uh, continue to flare in the Korean Peninsula as the U.S. and South Korea staged another show of force after North Korea launched an ICBM. A U.S. B-1B Lancer hypersonic bomber and F-16s joined South Korean F-35As in a flight on Sunday following Pyongyang's ICBM test on Friday. And, you know, kind of we've gone over this so many times, I really don't want to go over it again, you know, what the, the situation is and why tensions are so high. Uh, but I do think that this is a pretty significant milestone that we're seeing here. Another North Korean ICBM test, more U.S. nuclear-capable assets on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, this is certain that we're probably going to see uh, you know, this continue not only into December, but into 2023. Now, Connor, I'll hand it over to you. Tell us what the hell is going on with Iran. Yeah, so uh, while well, we have a sort of a Mercer Street redux uh, situation going on, uh, so basically, uh, the, uh, us, and this is from Dave DeCamp at antiwar.com on the 16th, uh, us Israel claim without evidence, Iran was behind a drone attack on a tanker near Oman. So now American and Israeli officials are accusing Iran of being behind, uh, an attack off the coast of Oman without providing evidence for their claim. This was late Tuesday. The Liberian flag tanker Pacific uh, Zykron was hit by an explosive laden drone, causing a, hull, a hole in the hull, uh, but resulting in no injuries to crew. Uh, the tanker is operated by Eastern Pacific Shipping, which is owned by Israeli billionaire Edan Offer. So you might remember, um, and I double checked for people who want to go back and look at this, but we covered the Mercer Street. Uh, on several episodes back last year in August. Um, but there's one episode in particular, number 167, where we go through a piece that uh, Alan McLeod had done at Mint Press News about the whole, all the ties the Offer family, E.L. and Edan, uh, have to uh, Israeli intelligence and covert operations um, uh, that have gone back decades. And, uh, of course, they, there was never sufficient evidence presented to show that Iran was responsible for the alleged drone attack, um, the alleged Iranian uh, drone attack uh, on the Mercer Street uh, last year. And so, which is sort of a similar situation. 
Um, but of course, it was ser- it served to ramp up tensions with Iran uh, significantly, uh, really being led by the Israelis, the Americans, and the British. Uh, and of course, it was really, I mean, I think largely intended to uh, put the new government that was coming into power, uh, the uh, Ibrahim Raisi admi- uh, government, uh, put them on the back foot and obviously thwart uh, any chances of diplomacy with the new uh, government. Um, and ultimately that worked, but I don't think in the short term that it did. But uh, again, now as we continue to uh, pile on sanctions onto Iran, supporting the protesters, uh, and of course there's, um, you know, there's we're, uh, there's the U.S. and its partners are covertly influencing what's going on there as well. Uh, the full extent, I don't think we know yet, uh, but we'll be talking about that more in the future on the show. But uh, of course, this is just going to escalate tensions further. Now, this is General Eric Carrillo, who we've been talking about what a hawk he is. He's taken over CENTCOM from Frank McKenzie. One of his biggest priorities, if not the biggest, was really building on this idea with that under the Abraham Accords, and now that we've brought in Israel into CENTCOM, we now have this tremendous opportunity ahead of us to uh, really integrate their missile and air defenses and build up these alliances. And, and, and really, it sort of dovetails with the Israeli priority of building this anti-Iran, NATO-style, U.S.-led alliance in the region. Uh, and, uh, and so there's so many special interests at work here, uh, but Carrillo really personifies that. And so he's claiming in comments to the Wall Street Journal that Iran is responsible. He says, this unmanned aerial vehicle attack against a civilian vessel in this critical maritime strait demonstrates once again the destabilizing nature of Iranian malign activity in the region. Now, uh, an Israeli official speaking to the AP said that it appears the attack was carried out by a Shahed 136 exploding drone, which Iran has allegedly provided uh, Russia, of course, but the Israeli official offered no evidence to back up that claim. Um, And Iran and Israel, uh, of course, there's often accusations, as Dave points out here, that they're they're each attacking tankers in the region. But the truth is, I mean, it's more or less in the media painted as this sort of um, either it's it's a it's a real problem that Iran is is ultimately responsible for. Uh, or they act like it's sort of a tit for tat kind of a thing. But the truth is, I mean, the, 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 most of this looks like it's usually the Israelis. I mean, when we've covered on just in the time we've been talking about this on the show, you know, there was this famous, uh, I should say notorious, uh, piece in the wall street journal last year, uh, that Dave links to here where, where they basically said that, you know, between 2019 and I think this was early last year. They had, uh, the Israelis had attacked more than a dozen ships, uh, usually Iranian vessels or tankers carrying oil in the Red Sea and other parts of the region. Uh, of course, they were constantly attacking Iranian ships trying to take fuel to uh, Syria. There was just recently the, um, I mean, so, uh, sort of on a similar note, there was this is Israeli drone bombing on the border of Iraq and Syria that attacked a truck convoy carrying, again, Iranian fuel apparently to uh, Lebanon, but or in Syria via Iraq. So um, and so again, as Dave points out here, they're not really including that context in the reporting on this alleged attack on this uh, Pacific Zikron, the uh, the Liberian flag tanker here. But uh, nevertheless, that is important to keep in mind and. You know, we could be seeing uh, further escalation again now in the uh, in sort of the Israeli covert war against Iran and then further responses and reactions on the part of the Iranians who are backed up against the wall right now dealing with, uh, of course, the protests, uh, let alone the economic war in Netanyahu coming to power. And uh, and actually the bombings in Syria are escalating significantly as well. Um, so. The next story here we have is uh, the IAEA again condemning Iran over its uh, supposed lack of cooperation on this, uh, you know, issue of the uh, the uh, trace particles of unprocessed uranium, unenriched uranium. And so we we've covered this, and uh, but it's important. I mean, so basically they've now voted again. The the IAEA body has voted to uh, condemn Iran for lack of cooperation on the question of the particles. Uh, this is the second condemnation uh, from the quarterly uh, uh, board of governors meeting. And so they're uh, Russia and China voted against it again. Uh, the allegation, uh, as Jason Ditz says here, 
Uh, again, this is Jason. I just want to point out, this is Jason Ditz from antiwar.com on the 17th. The article is IAEA again condemns Iran over lack of cooperation on particles. And so Jason points out that this, of course, isn't really correct. This idea that Iran is not cooperating. They've cooperated several times. They've, they've allowed the provided the IEA access to all these sites, uh, and they've provided all the full documentation. Uh, but of course, the U.S. rejects their explanation and then pressures the IEA or influences them anyway not to accept the explanation either. So it just becomes a, a constant recurring theme that they can uh, or issue that they can uh, beat Iran over the head with and prevent any restoration of the JCPOA or any negotiations because particularly the, the Americans insist on these um as Jason says, these outstanding issues being resolved before the deal can be sealed. So if they permanently keep this in this, um, if they just uh, never allow this uh, situation to resolve itself, if they never just take yes for an answer or no for an answer from Iran, uh, even if there is, of course, which there is, there's no proliferation risk here at all. Uh, they, it, it doesn't matter. It just, it just serves. Uh, it's a, another tool in the uh, in the toolbox for the Iran hawks and anybody who doesn't want to see this deal go through. Uh, and so. And he makes it and Jason makes a very important point here that this is, again, it goes back to the uh, problem with Tel Aviv uh, and our Iran policy in general. Uh, so, you know, when they originally announced that they had found these uh, uranium particles, there seemed to be at least some speculation that IAEA inspectors had accidentally contaminated the site. I mean, it could have been covert operators that Iran, that Israel has in Iran anyway. Um, but. You know, he says, even then, trace particles of raw, unenriched uranium are not a proliferation risk in and of itself. Uh, but for the so but for the U.S. and the EU wanting to make it an issue, it broadly doesn't matter. At the root of the scandal is Israel as the particles were, quote, found at Israeli alleged undeclared sites. So making them an issue serves to vindicate Tel Aviv's accusations. Iran denied the sites were ever nuclear related. Uh, and said that they were closed industrial sites. The sites were closed and cleaned, which fueled all these claims of a cover-up. All right. So um, now here's one. This is uh, U This is Dave DeCamp on the 20th. U.S. to deploy over 100 unmanned vessels to the Persian Gulf. So the U.S. Uh, Yes, the CENTCOM announced this weekend that a U.S.-led task force will deploy over 100 unmanned vessels to the Persian Gulf by this time next year as part of a regional effort against Iran. So, again, Carilla said at a conference in Bahrain, which is, of course, a, a, a signatory of the Abraham Accords, uh, said that Task Force 50 and where, where the Fifth Fleet is based, uh, they said uh, Task Force 59 will bring together a fleet. This is Carilla. Task Force 59 will bring together a fleet of over 100 unmanned surface and subsurface vessels operating together, communicating together and providing maritime domain awareness. Um, Task Force uh, 59. Let's see the announcement. Oh, yeah. So he's saying the announcement comes right after this incident in in off the coast of Oman. So, of course, exploiting this, whatever, whoever really was behind that attack. Uh, and then Carilla says that the greatest threat in the region is the development of, quote, adversary drones. So now we're really, you know, exploiting the whole situation in Ukraine, of course, to get more uh, money and assets and resources for central command saying, uh, besides deploying the drone boats to the region, Carilla said CENTCOM is also building an experimentation program here in the middle East to beat adversary drones with our partners. And we've been talking all year about how, uh, I mean, really they're, they're boosting this increased cooperation with these Arab States, these Gulf dictatorships, uh, that are, partners of the Americans and and now officially partners with Israel. Um, they're trying to expand this military cooperation and build up, like we said, I, like I said, this NATO style alliance or the integrated air defense systems and, you know, whatever they want to call it. Um, there's the Abraham Accords caucus, who's, you know, hugely in favor of this and constantly pushing this policy, of course, Carilla and CENTCOM. Um, but you know, when they, when he says we're building an experimentation program here, you know, he might be referring to, this was back in September. They were talking about this, uh, red sands integrated experimentation facility or center, um, which they're building, I believe in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and the idea is they're going to be 
this was in NBC News. These are Pentagon sources, and they're saying that they're building this thing. It's not going to be ready by the end of the year. But really, the idea is to develop these systems to integrate these air def- uh, these air defenses. Uh, and I mean, that's clearly what he's referring to, I think. Um, and it's supposed to play a huge role in this new burgeoning um, alliance system that they're developing. And so uh, the U.S. is looking to foster cooperation uh, between Israel and its Arab allies against Iran, Dave says here, uh, which, of course, is now you know facilitated as a result of the Abraham Accords uh, from going back to 2020 when they first uh, got the UAE and Bahrain to sign on. Um, and... Yeah, and then we have Brett McGurk, uh, who, of course, is a huge hawk uh, and is really in favor of this sort of back to basics approach in the Middle East. Um, You know, even though numbers have drawn down in terms of the troop presence uh, for CENTCOM by the tens of thousands just in these last couple of years, uh, I, you know, I mean, there was really this sort of when Biden came in, uh, this anticipation that we would be or that the American military would be really shifting uh, very quickly into just focusing on primarily Indo-Pacific command and, and Europe, uh, Europe command, uh, European command. And, um, but so, uh, you know, this whole policy was done basically to reassure Israel and these other states that, no, that's not the case. We're going to stay firmly planted here. And so what he's saying is, uh, the U S is actively building an integrate and, and enabling an integrated air and maritime defense architecture in this region. Uh, and so, um, let's see the U S effort to increase military cooperation against Iran comes as, of course, as the talks have been stalled. Um, and, uh, let's see the, oh, and then Dave just points out, of course, like we've said before that the, you know, they've admitted that they're, they know Iran is not building a bomb, but of course they're preparing for war with them anyway, over this fictitious excuse that they, if they, if they do get one that they don't have, that we said, they're not trying to build, uh, then we have to go to war, uh, because we've promised Israel that we will, or, you know, whatever, you know, Biden's declaration in Jerusalem here this over the summer. Uh, and so, and of course we have Robert Malley of all people going, uh, who was supposed to return the U S to the JCPOA, um, <laughs> saying that, you know, they're preparing a military option as a last resort and the U S officials saying this same sort of thing. Um, and so, uh, or state department officials in the media, like in Axios and things. And so, yeah, we're just seeing more and more escalation here. Uh, and they're using, um, it looks like they're trying to apply a lot more pressure to, uh, Iran here. Now, uh, there's another piece here from Jason Ditz on the 21st. Iran attacks uh, Kurdish Peshmerga in uh, northern Iraq, in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. This is from uh, the 21st by Jason Ditz. After weeks of relative calm on the border, Iran has once again struck Peshmerga in Iraqi Kurdistan, claiming them to be separatist elements. Uh, one Peshmerga was confirmed killed, and a Kurdish political leader said several were slain. Iranian semi-official media claimed 26 uh, were killed. So Iran has accused several foreign factions of fueling unrest and has targeted the Kurds over this several times, likely because they're conveniently close. Um, Iraq said that it strongly condemned the Iranian strikes as a sovereignty violation, as well as the Turkish airstrikes, which targeted northern uh, Iraq. Uh, Iraqi Kurdistan the day before. Um, and then he's just saying that basically, I mean, there's not there. It's almost like these strikes don't seem to be accomplishing anything. Uh, but they're probably just supposed to reassure hardliners that something is being done about the, uh, the the foreign interference, uh, with respect to the protests and the chaos going on inside the country. Um, although it doesn't seem to be that Iran, uh, it doesn't seem to appear that Iran is gaining too much control over the situation, uh, which, uh, which Jason talks about here as well. Um, now what I really want to, uh, get into here from this piece, uh, that Daniel Larison wrote, uh, at responsible statecraft, it's all about Ron DeSantis's foreign policy. And, uh, it's the spotlight at antiwar.com today. And it's really important because so many libertarians, especially right-leaning libertarians are very enthusiastic about Ron DeSantis, particularly because of his record on, uh, the COVID regime. Uh, which sure, I mean, 
you know, that <laughs> this was something that, you know, of course, Pat has written, uh, Pat, our great colleague, Pat McFarlane at the Libertarian Institute has written about how DeSantis was actually uh, pretty horrible on COVID originally, but then actually did become much better and was certainly one of the best governors in the country on the issue and really won in a landslide victory uh, here during the midterms, uh, really taking a purple state like Florida and turning it just, I mean, red. Uh, you know, and just assured victory for the party, basically, uh, you know, it's just in, in very impressive showing. And so, but it's important, you know, because this guy is like Trump, there's a cult of personality around him. And there's a lot of reasons why certain right wing libertarians find him very appealing. But the truth is, I mean, really, this would be on, it's on the foreign policy front and then likely on the domestic, you know, national security state front. We're talking about a throwback to the George W. Bush neoconservative era that we all grew up in, uh, and which I think right now with the current tensions with Russia and China, not to mention Iran, which we're going to get to his Iran policies and when, you know what he uh, what his takes on Iran were uh, during his time in Congress. Um, it, it really, I mean, it's, it, even what we're just talking about, all these tensions on the Korean Peninsula, I think bringing in a guy like him as bad as Biden is, I'm not saying he would be worse than Biden, but there's definitely a chance that he could be. Uh, you know, just imagine George W. Bush being president while we're on the brink of nuclear war. Uh, so, all right. So I'm going to get here into these uh, points that Dan makes that I think are really important to highlight. So before he left the House for Tallahassee, De uh, DeSantis established himself as a vocal critic of the Obama administration's foreign policy with an emphasis on attacking U.S. diplomatic engagement with Iran and Cuba. So essentially the only good things Barack Obama ever did. Uh, the hardline positions that DeSantis has taken issues on uh with respect to Iran, Cuba, and Venezuela are not surprising given Florida politics, but they have aligned him closely with Florida's hawkish Senator Marco Rubio and uh, Sen uh, you know, the neocon Senator Tom Cotton uh, from Arkansas. So during the original debate over the JCPOA, DeSantis was an early and vocal opponent of an agreement with Iran. He co-authored a July 2015 op-ed in Time with Tom Cotton, outlining the usual hawkish objections to the deal. Like most critics of the agreement, they misrepresented what it would do and exaggerated the benefits Iran would receive from sanctions relief. The op-ed was long on outrage and short on offering any serious alternative diplomacy to resolve the nuclear issue. DeSantis and Cotton also indulged in rather hysterical threat inflation about Iran, saying they will stop at nothing to end our way of life. In addition to the op-ed, DeSantis released statements and spoke on the House floor many times denouncing any agreement with Iran that would allow them to retain any part of their nuclear program. He continued to rail against it after the agreement was implemented. Under Trump, DeSantis was enthusiastic in support for undermining and leaving the JCPOA and imposing additional sanctions on Iran. On the decision to renege on the JCPOA, he said Trump did the right thing. Going beyond the Trump administration's stated goals for reimposing sanctions, DeSantis has imagined that the Iranian government could be brought down through more outside pressure. In a Fox News segment, he sketched out his idea of how regime change might happen. Quote, so I think the more we can connect people and expand social networks there, I do think that this regime's days are numbers and the more success we uh, these days, uh, this regime's days are numbered and the more success we have in choking off the money and opening up the networks means their demise will be met quicker. So judging from his record, it is reasonable to assume that if DeSantis was elected president, he would have no interest in negotiating with Iran about anything and would instead be looking for ways to destabilize and topple the government there. And then, you know, it's important because. Uh, DeSantis has also been one of the most fervent anti-free speech uh, politicians in the country when it comes to uh, these anti-BDS laws and crim criminalizing, um, you know, uh, boy boycotts of Israel and opposition to uh, Israel. Uh, that's something I really need to dig in here as he gains more steam. Uh, and we'll talk about that more uh, soon, I'm sure. But just to go through some more examples that DeSantis has here. Uh, excuse me, that Larison has here of how bad DeSantis was when he was in Congress. 
you know, he says DeSantis had already left the House by the time that Congress made its war powers challenge to U.S. involvement in the Saudi-led coalition war on Yemen. But while he was there, he was a reliable vote against any restrictions on U.S. weapons going to Saudi Arabia. For example, he voted against a 2016 amendment that would have prevented the transfer of cluster munitions to the Saudis. Now, you might think that this was like a, a partisan decision, but Larison says the vote on the amendment was not strictly along party lines. There were 40 Republicans that voted for limiting the kinds of weapons uh, being transferred to Saudi Arabia after the war had been going on for a year. But DeSantis stuck with most of his party on this question. On other issues, DeSantis was a cheerleader for Trump's early hawkish decisions. He touted Trump's decision to provide military assistance to, uh, to Ukraine to arm Kiev and or uh, to order attacks on Syrian government targets. Which is interesting because I believe he wasn't in favor of uh, Barack Obama's uh, decision to deploy troops to Syria originally. But, you know, it's just interesting how uh, right wingers get around this. That de the Democrats start a war and then you don't support leaving. But, you know, bombing Damascus, that sounds like a good idea. So he says when John Bolton was named national security advisor, DeSantis praised the choice. John Bolton, it, it's a very strong choice, very clear thinker. And uh, Dan says, we don't know yet who will be advising DeSantis on foreign policy, but his positive view of Bolton gives us some idea of the kind of people he would probably have around him. Uh, and of course, Joseph Solis Mullins had a piece for Antiwar.com earlier this year uh, that shows the <laughs> that all the time that DeSantis has spent at places like the Hudson Institute, uh, which is basically – uh, just a PNAC, a project for new American style, a uh, project for new American century style, neoconservative think tank, ultra hawkish on China, Russia, Iran. Um, and so, uh, now, I mean, he just talks more and more about just how bad he was on North Korea, praising, you know, regime change policies in Venezuela. Of course, the sanctions on Venezuela, which have killed tens of thousands of people, uh, uh, and he's really, it sounds like a, uh, a huge hawk and just generally in Latin America talking about us getting more and more and, and more interventionist in these policies, uh, says the threat of totalitarianism and socialism in our hemisphere, uh, is spreading, uh, and he's calling, uh, Gustavo Petro a narco terror, uh, terrorist, uh, without any evidence. And, um, you know, as he says, while it might play well to the electorate in Florida, uh, Dan says it's unlikely to be well received in the wider region, of course. And um, also, he just points out that, you know, on the most important issue right now, DeSantis, I believe, is also a, a pretty serious China hawk. Um, have to see what his uh, policies are with respect to, uh, you know, when he starts running, we can get a clearer idea of, uh, you know, what he what he thinks as far as like support for Taiwan and sanctions and everything else, but, and the military, uh, in, uh, surround, you know, encircling of China. But importantly, when it comes to Ukraine, it sounds like, you know, he's one of these right winger, uh, neocons who's basically blaming Biden, you know, punching him from the right, not for being, uh, you know, not for being some Kiev firster or NATO firster. It's that he's, he's weak and encouraging bad actors, right. To, to, I guess, to defy American global supremacy. So he says, when Biden fumbled in Afghanistan, when you had 13 service members killed, when you left all that equipment behind, when you left a bunch of other Americans behind, the humiliation of that experience is something Russia was watching, DeSantis said during a March 3rd uh, press conference. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's no, as, as he says, there's no real... Um, there's no real evidence that he would push back on any of the uh, neoconservative foreign policy establishment's uh, prerogatives. If anything, he could be more hawkish. And uh, I think um, certainly DeSantis' ability to sort of, um, I don't know, I mean, play up that sort of uh, – call. I mean, he, like Trump, he's sort of a character where – He's viewed as anti-establishment when his foreign policy views, there's a better argument with Trump that he wasn't, uh, you know, he was to some degree going against the grain, although extreme, I mean, very weak and, and really buckled under any kind of resistance. Um, I mean, people can blame that on the deep state all they want, but at the end of the day, it's, it's his decision and his call, uh, to never leave Syria to escalate the Cold War with Russia and China uh, to escalate, to nearly start a war with Iran to set records for all the bombs he dropped in uh, in Somalia and Yemen and Afghanistan, and of course to 
uh, make the the occupation of Syria and the Caesar Act sanctions regime destroying the country, starving tens of millions to make that um, to make that uh, permanent or, uh, you know, 60 percent of the population. I think it's like uh, more than 12 million people last I saw on the U.N. numbers, but just absolutely devastating the country. And, and of course, attempted regime change uh, in Venezuela. So. Um, I mean, the idea with DeSantis, there's no real pretending. I mean, the guy is just a straight up neoconservative um, and he does have a record to prove it. Uh, I mean, writing a, a letter with Tom, I mean, an, an op ed with Tom Cotton. I mean, that says a hell of a lot about where this guy is coming from. So uh, just very important for people to keep an eye out and uh, remember that we're we should be prioritizing this issue uh, above uh you know, domestic issues. If if DeSantis, I think DeSantis, people should be railing against this guy for his policies when it comes to BDS and these uh, um, these laws against free speech regarding Israel. But you know, he's much better off, uh, at least for the rest of us, if he remains just governor of Florida. Certainly not taking the Oval Office. All right, Connor. Thank you so much for that breakdown. I just want to remind uh, people that you have a fantastic op-ed out that. Was it the spotlight today or yesterday? I don't know. It was the spotlight this week at antiwar.com. It's titled Forever War at the End of the World. It was published November 17th. You can find it at the Libertarian Institute. And uh, while you're at it, check out Connor's full archive. There's just so much, so many great articles in there now. It's actually, it, you know, it's a couple pages long, Connor. You are really starting to crank out the articles and doing a lot of work. And I know we're uh, very lucky to have you over at the Institute. And I'm lucky to have you as a co-host of this show. And so I uh, just want to remind people, hey, if you can, support the show, share the show, maybe recommend it at Thanksgiving dinner or something like that. Hope you all have a nice uh, long weekend here. Got, uh, most of you probably have a day off work or two and uh, get to relax a little bit and uh, enjoy some good turkey or something like that. So, Connor, again, thank you, and uh, we'll be back with more shows next week.